Open your Bibles. Let's do this part. Oh, man, I love this message. Oh, man. <laughs> Title of the message this morning, Lessons in Foot Washing. I hope that, um, uh, that your feet are clean today and that you've done your toes because uh, at the end, we're going to all take off our shoes and wash each other's feet. Listen, listen, I've done that. It is so incredibly awkward. It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> so, you know, get ready. Uh, no, no, it's not. We're not doing that. We are learning the lessons in foot washing today from John chapter 13. Go to John 13. In our last message, we reviewed like the first days of the Passion Week, and I really tried to set the stage of the intensity of the Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' earthly life before the cross. The Passion Week starts with the triumphal entry. It ends with the resurrection, and in between is some of the most intense, back-to-back, -back, straightforward, in-your-face teaching in the entire entire Gospels, and we love it. We love it. Jesus has taken the gloves off completely. We saw last week the WWE Smackdown approach that Jesus used with the religious leaders, uh, including the pile driver move, my favorite. Uh, <laughs> I sound like I watch wrestling, right? I, I don't. Uh, but it is pretty hilarious. But I do uh, periodically watch Nacho Libre, so uh, it's kind of like wrestling. Uh, listen, today Jesus is done with all of that. He's done, he's done. He's done. He has accomplished what he needed to accomplish with the religious leaders in the first few days of Passion Week. They are going to do what he needs them to do by the time he needs them to do it so that he ends up on the cross at the exact moment he's done. And now his focus turns completely to his disciples and us. From chapter 13 on, the focus is on the disciples until, uh, until the cross. So he's going to lead his disciples into an upper room, have them go, and he's going to prepare a place for them to go and prepare for them to have what we call the Last Supper, uh, because it's the last uh, supper he eats with his disciples, but uh, it's more correctly called the Passover meal. And in that time, we have what we call the upper room discourse in the Gospel of John, which if you were to say, what is the most compact, condensed, in critically important teaching in the life of Christ? It is hands down, without question, John 13 to John 17, the upper room discourse. An absolute phenomenal teaching. The rest of the Gospels are all equally important, but man, he's not messing around. He's like, okay, I got, I got one pita dinner uh, to finish everything I need to finish with the disciples before the arrest. And so his teaching style is so intense, so condensed, so powerful. It is the final verbal revelation of Jesus to his disciples. Do you understand the importance, the priority that we put on it and why? All right, it's not above the rest of the, the scriptures, but it gives you a sense. So today, he's gonna start with an example, an object lesson that will literally transform every area of your life if you'll receive it. Every area of your life will be transformed if you take in what Jesus is teaching today. I promise that's the importance of it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, please. Lord, there's so much in this one example, in these short 17 verses, Lord. God, there's so much. Please make our hearts ready. Lord, connect it by your spirit. Connect it to things that are really happening in our lives right now. And Lord, most importantly, give us the commitment and the power to apply it. Give us the commitment and the power to apply your word today for your glory in our lives, Jesus, and in your name, amen. <sighs> Ready? Jesus beginning with an object lesson. 
An object lesson is, is something that's taught uh, with a physical object that the lesson is not uh, literally the object. It's an object lesson. The object today is the foot washing. The lesson is threefold. It's threefold. It's very big. It's very intense. And you really have to pay attention. So here's the first of the three incredible lessons in the foot washing. It is, I'm just going to tell you the lesson so you don't have to figure it out. Extreme humility. Extreme humility even unto death. Extreme humility. John 13, verse 1. Here's the setup. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Just underline those words, to the very end. Uh, they're important. It's Thursday now, most likely, maybe midday. The Passover celebration begins at sundown on Friday. And so Jesus must be on and off the cross within about 24 hours of where he's at right now. And so he knows his hour has come. In, in verse 1 where it says, Jesus knew his hour had come, uh, literally, it's, it's within 24 hours. Jesus knew that as the true Passover lamb, that he had to be sacrificed prior to the Passover meal, which was in 24 hours, sundown on Friday. And so it says that Jesus had loved his disciples. We see it, of course, all through his ministry. But now it says he loved them to the very end. Do you know what an idiom is? I don't mean an idiom like your husband is sometimes. Uh, I mean idiom. An idiom. An idiom is a phrase that is culturally understood but means something other than the literal meaning. Like when we say, you know, that's a dime a dozen or these things are a dime a dozen uh, or when we tell an actor to break a leg or, you know, kick the bucket or, you know, there's all kinds of them. Uh, those are idioms. This phrase in the Greek, he loved them to the very end, is an idiom. It's an idiom and uh, that's really important to know. Here's what it means. It means he showed them the full extent of his love. He now showed them the full extent of his love. Talking about the upper room discourse, of course, but then also the arrest, the trials, the, and the crucifixion. This is the beginning, God, John says, by the, the power of the Holy Spirit, of Jesus showing his disciples the full extent of his love. It's an important uh, thing. The NLT nicely puts that in a footnote uh, on that verse. Why is it important? Um, because, like I've said, Jesus is in the crucial last hours. And he's saying, listen, I need you to know the full extent of my love, but I also need you to know the full or final preparation for you to continue to follow me in this world after I'm gone tomorrow. <laughs> John 13, verse two. It was time for supper. This is so important that you hear the rest of verse two. And the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. It is so important to note before you hear this lesson and you say, well, that doesn't apply to so-and-so because they didn't invite me to their birthday party. Well, how about if, if they betrayed you to death? Would it apply to them then? <laughs> I, I know, I teach best with sarcasm. Um, it was a class I took. Teaching and offending with sarcasm. Listen, Judas Iscariot's in the room. And Jesus is going to love him with knowing the devil had already entered him to betray him. Jesus was going to show him this same level of love as all of what we would call the true disciples. That's such a huge point. 
John 13, verse 3. Jesus knew, man, this is all so good. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. Can I tell you something, please? What Jesus knew is why he did what he did. What Jesus knew controlled his actions, set his actions. What he knew is why he did what he did. Here's what he knew. He knew his hour had come to lay his life down for mankind. He knew Judas, who was in the room, was about to betray him. He knew the Father had given all things into his hands, as verse 3 just said. He knew he had come from God. He knew he was returning to God. He was fully aware of his full authority over all of creation as King of kings and Lord of lords. And he knew without a doubt that one day every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus knew his place. He knew his place place. And it was because of what he knew that he did what he did. It's really, really important because generally when we uh, fail this test of extreme humility, it's because we don't know who we are in Christ. And the flesh stirs up all kinds of insecurities and and desires to prove ourselves and defend ourselves and be something and win and all that other dark sin. Jesus knew who he was and that's why he did what he did and that's why this lesson is so crushing. Remember, Judas is in the room. Jesus is teaching by example an object lesson and he's calling us to follow the leader. It's a game of follow the leader. What he's about to do, if it doesn't teach us this lesson of extreme humility, nothing will. This is, this is one of the most intense lessons, save the cross, of the humility of Jesus Christ, of anything we can read. Let me just explain humility uh, as, an, as a passing thought. Humility is not thinking low of yourself. Generally, people who think very low of themselves have extreme pride issues. They're totally focused on themselves. Humility is not thinking about yourself. It's emptying yourself of self. It's emptying yourself of all self. That's humility. And and you have to fight. (laughs) You have to fight the the flesh and your pride to do that. Here's Jesus' example, John 13, verse 4. So he got up from the table, knowing full well of all who he was, all of who he was. He took off his robe, his outer robe. He wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. The center of heaven's focus King of kings and Lord of lords, whose place is at the right hand of the Father, who will sit as judge over all of creation, has just taken on the lowest task of the lowest servant slave. The lowest task of the lowest servant slave. In fact, Jewish servants in general were not even required to wash feet. It was too low for a Jewish slave. Only goyim, which is a a word of of real disrespect to the nations, the Gentiles. Only goyim slaves, Gentile slaves, were required to wash feet. And so Jesus was below a Jewish slave. It's a really, really, really big deal. Why? Why, Jesus? Why? Was it because the disciples' feet were dirty? No, if you've heard this thing about, oh, no one else washed their feet, so Jesus had to do it, forget about it, all right? Jesus wasn't like, well, if no one else is gonna do it, I guess I'll have to. Uh Uh-uh, it's so much bigger. It's so much bigger than that. Number one, Jesus is revealing his heart to us. He's saying, this is how low I'm willing to place myself for your good. 
This is the level at which I am willing to humiliate myself for your good. That's number one. And number two, Jesus wants us to know what it looks like when our heart becomes his heart. Jesus wants us to know as soon as we are living like this, it's because there's no longer self that's been destroyed. When Christ lives in me, this is what it looks like, right? Everyone's like, oh man. One commentator connected this action to the entire event of Christ and the cross. Here's his connections. He says, Jesus rose from the table just as he rose from his place of perfect fellowship with God. Jesus laid aside his garments just as he laid aside his godly attributes. Jesus took a towel and wrapped it around himself just as he took on the lowly form of human flesh to become a man. Jesus poured water into a basin just as his blood was poured out to cleanse us. He washed the disciples' feet just as his blood washed our sins away. And he wiped, he wiped them with a towel that was around him just as he ever lives to care for us and intercede for us as our shepherd and our high priest. If we don't stop and grasp how low, how lowly of a servant's job this is, we'll miss the power. We say, we, we say, I don't deserve to do that. I don't, I don't, I don't need to do that. Not after what they've done, right? If we don't see what Jesus is doing He's taken on the lowest of the low position and he's washing the feet of Judas Iscariot while Judas Iscariot was possessed by the devil and about to betray him unto death. And so when we say, well, so-and-so hurt my feelings, so I'm certainly not gonna humble myself to them. (laughs) Uh, You get the picture. You probably got it 10 minutes ago. This is real life, and and that's why I'm trying to let it sit on you. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would just put things in your mind, like, "Uh uh-oh, really, Lord? Oh, you're kidding me. Oh, are you telling me I have to do that? Come on, Lord. No, certainly, I gotta gotta think about something else. I gotta, uh, yeah, that's what I'm hoping is happening. That's what I'm praying is happening. Uh, so get ready, because Jesus is going to tell you you have to do just what he's doing here. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, just in case there's someone in the room that hasn't caught it yet, let me repeat it. <laughs> when, we do, when we do cross-references, it's so that we can make the same point using another verse uh, to reinforce. So uh, let's do that in Philippians 2. If, if Philippians 2 isn't all marked up in your Bible, uh, it should be. Uh, especially uh, these verses. Philippians 2, as King of kings and Lord of lords, creator of heaven and earth, Jesus certainly didn't deserve to become the lowest servant. He certainly didn't deserve to, to serve those who by nature and by choice deserved only judgment. Let me say that again. I'll say it slower. Jesus Christ, being who he was, certainly didn't deserve to do what he's doing for those who by nature and by choice deserved only judgment. We have people like that in our lives. And we are called to follow his example. The Bible is painfully clear and Philippians 2.5 helps. Philippians 2.5 says, you must have the same attitude. Oh, what does that mean in the Greek? <laughs> it means you must have the same attitude. Let this mind be in you that that was in Christ Jesus. It means that we have to approach things the same way Jesus approached them. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, 
He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up. The word is he, he willingly released, willingly surrendered his divine privileges. He willingly set them aside. He took on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, verse 8 says he humbled himself meaning he emptied himself of all of his attributes. He humbled himself in obedience to God to death. Humbled himself in obedience and died a criminal's death on a cross. And verse 5 says, we must have the same attitude. Surely God is kidding. Surely he's not. God's calling us to this same level of supernatural humility. Can I tell you what the key word in the Bible is? I mean, when we're talking about transformation, the key word is supernatural, right? Because this is anti-natural. This is contrary to your entire nature. Everything that's in you by nature and choice is contrary to this. And so as you continually crucify the flesh, continually reject the notion of the flesh, and continually be empowered by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, you can live like this because you've been called to live like this, and God would never call you to something without empowering you by his Spirit to accomplish it. And so when we say, no, I can't do that, well, duh, <laughs> right? <laughs> of course you can. So die, you know, die, die to yourself, crucify your flesh because Jesus Christ in you can do this. And when he does it, it, it brings such great glory and testimony. I didn't say great glory. It doesn't bring great glory. It brings great glory. Okay. <laughs> And maybe Greg Laurie, I don't know if he's in the neighborhood, maybe. God's given us his own power in the Holy Spirit to enable us to empty ourselves of self and to be filled with the life of Christ so that we can live in the image of Christ, live with the same attitude, the same mind as Christ. Total humility is emptying ourselves of ourselves and allowing the life of Christ to live in and through us. You ready to move on to the second lesson? <laughs> I would guess you were. Uh, I certainly am. First lesson's humility. Second lesson's no easier. Second lesson is holiness. Humility and holiness. John 13, go back to John 13. John 13, verse 6. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, hey, do you know that there's a positive way and a negative way to teach the same truth? Uh, this is what we would call the negative way. It's the what not to do way. So watch it, it's, it's good. Back to verse six. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, the meaning to wash his feet, Peter said to him, Lord, are you gonna wash my feet? Moi? Ha! In the original, the language here is offense. Like Peter is offended even unto, even leaning to anger at Jesus, which we know Peter has the ability to do to, to um, reprimand Jesus. He does in Matthew 16. <sighs> Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replies with such grace. He says in verse 7, <sighs> Peter. You don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. In other words, hey, Peter, let it go, okay? Let this happen, you'll understand later. But Peter is like us. He says, no, verse eight, no, Peter protested. You will never, ever wash my feet. Again, the Greek there is, you will never for all eternity wash my feet. I don't, I don't care, Jesus. I don't care how long, it's never going to happen. It is so emphatic. And so what Jesus teaches us to do by example, Peter teaches us what not to do by example. And so you can learn from both, right? <laughs> uh, it's funny. I used to tell my kids all the time. Um, uh, I hmm, uh, guess I'm too far into this now. I would say, listen, you know that, that person, you know, you see how their life is, is destroyed? Uh, don't do that. Uh, not to any of you. 
promise. But, uh, but, you know, every once in a while you see a life that's really been destroyed and it's a pretty good lesson. Like, you know, if you get on the same road, you end up in the same place. It's not rocket science. Uh, so Peter helps us like that. Uh, this is the uh, road not to take. Never shall you wash my feet even into all eternity. But Peter needed his feet washed because he had a terrible case of foot and mouth disease. But, but Jesus couldn't wash his feet because they're shoved in his mouth. And so Jesus uh, is polite uh, with Peter and he kind of waits till he's switching feet to say to him the second lesson in the second half of John 13, be encouraged if you have the same traits as Peter. John 13, 8b, second half, Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. This is a very powerful theological statement in response to a very fleshly statement, right? Jesus' statement uh, of washing uh, the, the disciples' feet is a massive theology statement. Peter's statement's a massive flesh statement, but Jesus uses it just the same. And so you can hear that when Jesus says, Unless I wash you, you won't have any part of me, your literal says. You won't belong to me. And you can say, well, you can hear Peter say, wait, 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 wait. I didn't know anything about that, all right? I didn't know anything about that. I won't have any part in you. You didn't tell me that. And so now Peter's going to switch from uh, foot and mouth disease to pendulum disease. Have you known these people? It's like, you know, when, however they respond, you know it's going to be extreme. So if they expand, respond extreme one way and, and you, you try to correct that, there's a chance they're going to respond extreme the other way. So get used to it. Uh, it's just, you know, it might be a personality thing. It is with Peter. Here's his pendulum response. John 13, verse 9, Simon Peter exclaimed, Then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. <laughs> oh, Peter the pendulum. These, these statements are full flesh, all right? Peter is, is, I know that the Holy Spirit's only with him right now, not in him yet, but, but really, this is what it looks like when you're responding in the flesh to the Lord Jesus. Uh, so both these responses are in the flesh, and so Jesus has to explain it. Here it is, John 13, verse 10. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash, except for the feet, to be entirely clean. Here's the explanation sentence. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. Remember, it's an object lesson. It is an object that teaches a lesson that is not the object. So just let me just test you, following me. Is Jesus talking about dirt on feet? No, he's not. So we have to decide what he is talking about. He's not talking about dirt on your feet. The last sentence in verse 10 says, you disciples are clean, but not all of you. He's not saying there's one of you who hasn't taken a bath. Who's he talking about? Judas, right? He's talking about Judas. So does that, that means the object lesson is about spiritual cleanliness, not dirt on feet, which is why we can say, hey, we'll pass on the foot washing thing. I mean, it was fun. It was not fun when, when Pam and I did it, but it was weird, but we did it anyway. Uh, but uh, this is an object lesson. It's about spiritual cleanliness, about being spiritually clean. Here's the background. The roads were dirt. The roads of the world were dirt, and trust me, they still are, and I'm not just talking about Nuevo. The road of the world is dirty. And when you walk on it, your feet get dirty. And in the first century, Jesus, what he's using for the object lesson is the disciples bathe, they walk from one house to another, their feet get dirty, and so a servant, the lowest servant, washes their feet. That's all true culturally. It's not the point spiritually. Here's the point. Jesus is talking about the necessity of walking in holiness. We know that because of his comment about Judas. One more time for clarity, verse 11 of John 13 says, For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant 
when he said, not all of you are clean. Guys, please hear me, all right? When someone tries to pull wacky interpretations out of the Bible, when God wants to make something clear, he just writes it. He just writes it down. And so here, the Holy Spirit leads John to, to clarify, Jesus is talking about spiritual uncleanness. He's talking about Judas. Here's the object lesson. If you are born again today, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior through faith in him, through true faith in him, you have been cleaned. You have been bathed all over by the blood of the Lamb, cleansing you from sin. And listen, that's permanent. We believe we believe clearly that that is permanent, that it's permanent. The Bible gives us basis that that work is a finished work. When Jesus said to tell us die on the cross, it is finished. It's finished. It's a finished work. It's a permanent work. But here's the problem. It's positional. It's positional. Here's what you need to understand about your salvation. There is positional and practical salvation. And you can be saved positionally and live like you're in the front line to hell. All right, it happens. It happens. So Jesus is saying, listen, you are, if you are bathed all over, you are cleansed. You are positionally saved. But walking in the world, you get the dirt of the world on you. You can't help it. And so the dirt on the world, the dirt of the world on you has to be cleansed. It, it has to be cleansed off of you. Why is it important? Because in verse eight, Jesus says, if you do not wash, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. You have no share with me. The NLT uh, says you won't belong to me. ESV says you have no share. I think New King James says you have no part. It means, listen carefully, it means if I don't wash you, if I don't take the dirt of the world off of you, you have no participation with me. You have no sharing with me. You have no relationship with me. How many of us know that sin separates us relationally from God? Sin separates us relationally from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, the Lord's arm's not short, that he can't heal. His ear's not heavy, that he can't hear. hear, hear. Your sins have separated you from your Lord. When, when David, I, I, you, you believe me, I don't, have to keep, I don't have to keep reinforcing it. Your sin separates you relationally from God. How often do you need to be restored, need to be cleansed of the sin of walking in the world and in the flesh to maintain the unity of your relationship with Christ? The answer is continually. This is the truth, continually. Positionally, you are in Christ, but practically, you got the dirt of the world on you. And so there is this need to continually be cleansed by the power of the Word of God, lit alive by the Holy Spirit, and then, and then applied practically in repentance and forgiveness. Man, that's really, really good. 1 John 1, 9, write it in your margin. If you haven't memorized it yet, do it today. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we acknowledge our sin, confess it. When we repent of it and ask the Lord to heal us, there is a cleansing and a reestablishment of relationship with Christ that is critical for our continual walking with him, right? And you know, you know, you know that if you, the longer you spend not doing that, the further away you get from the Lord until you are walking in complete darkness. And so the answer is to always be cleansed, to always come back to the cross, to walk in that holiness every day, every day, every day, by the Spirit, through the Word, and in relationship with Jesus Christ. Does it make sense? Yes? Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. For, sometimes I just finish up in my own mind and chuckle. Uh, for, <laughs> I, I feel bad because, you know, I feel like I'm dropping a hammer on you because I, I, uh, it's just so meaningful to me because I see it. 
I see it so much. First lesson is humility. Second lesson is holiness. To close, the third lesson is servanthood. Servanthood, humility, holiness, and servanthood. Do you remember when I said that if you grasp this object lesson from Christ, that it will transform every area of your life? If you, if you walk in the humility of Christ, if you understand the need for daily holiness, and if you embrace the concept of servanthood that Jesus is about to mention, uh, it will change change every single area of your life. John 13, verse 12, Jesus is going to explain it. I'm going to put it up in the ESV uh, because I like it better in these verses. John 13, verse 12, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you have any idea what I've done? Do you understand what I've done to you? Do you think they understood? No way. They're like, Jesus, this is a little awkward. You know, you're washing my feet and all. They didn't understand. And so Jesus is going to explain it to them, which is really great of him. John 13, 13 to 15, Jesus breaks it down. John 13, 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. Verse 15, I have given you an example to follow. Do, do, just underline the word, do as I have done to you. Verses 13 and 14 are what's called an a fortiori argument, a legal argument uh, that says, if this is true for the greater, how much more true is it for the lesser? If this is true for Jesus Christ, how much more true should it be for us? If Jesus has taken on the position of the lowest servant for us, even ultimately to death, how much more are we called to take on the lowest position of a servant for one another, even to death, even if it's just death of self and self-focus and self-righteousness and all things self? If the center of heaven's focus has humbled himself to this extent, how much more so are we called to humble ourselves to one another, meaning empty self of self? Here's something that's interesting. Consider this. This is not a public teaching. This wasn't done in public. Jesus could have done this in public. But he sequestered, he secluded his disciples, and he taught them this. And to me, that says this is not primarily uh, for the unbelieving world, but is primarily for co-disciples, those who are following Christ together. Please track with me on this right now, because I'm going to tell you something that I hesitated telling you, but it's so truth you need to, it's so true you need to hear it. Jesus is teaching us to walk in extreme humility and to walk in daily holiness. In fact, to help one another walk in daily holiness. He was not talking about the unbelieving public, and it's too bad he wasn't because it's so much easier to act humble and holy to people who don't know you, right? Huh? Come on. Uh, one of the things I feel really bad about for people is, is when I show up and they start acting different. It's like, seriously, what? You know, what do you do, what do, you do that? Don't do that. You know, it's okay. I don't have a collar on. Uh, you know, we're following Jesus together. But people, how much more so in the world do people put on humility and, and holiness in the church? because it's so much easier. Here's the truth I struggle with telling you, okay? This is one of the major reasons that I have experienced people leave this church, right here. I believe it's rampant in the church in America. I believe it's rampant in our culture. Here's what I mean. Jesus is talking about living in extreme humility and in daily holiness among those that you're following Jesus with, among your community of believers. And so here's what I've seen happen more times than, than, than I, could, I could have nightmares about. Someone gets in a position in the church, usually through sin, 
that requires them to walk in extreme humility and daily holiness with people who know the truth about them. What do they do? Boom! They're gone. Because there's a church down the road that's cooler anyway. And I'm not talking about AC. There's a hipper church down the road, and they don't know me. And so I don't have to deal with this. I don't have to deal with this event that requires my humility. I don't have to deal with this event that requires my holiness, my daily holiness. I can get the heck out of here, go to a cooler place anyway where they don't know me, and they'll think I'm humble and holy because they don't know me. It's terrible. It's absolutely uh, uh, it's demonically inspired, I just tell you. Because God wants to transform you. He wants to transform you into, a, into true humility and true daily holiness. And if you bolt every time he clicks up the notch of the refiner's fire, you will never be transformed. You will always walk in your sin. You'll attend 10 churches and you'll always be serving the enemy instead of God. Don't do it. And when people around you say, oh, I didn't like the pastor's shoes today. I'm going to a different church. Tell them, oh, there's something God's trying to do in your life you're trying to run from, huh? Well, good luck with that. Right? I mean, that's serious, man. That's serious. That's serious. Don't let people run from what God is trying to do in their lives. Help them. Help them. When you see Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, it is being part of the holiness of the disciples. It's, it's taking a proactive role in their cleansing of sin. That's what we're called to do, to hold one another accountable and to help one another grow up in Christ. Is, that, is it okay that I shared that with you? Please, I'm telling you. We got an epidemic in this culture of people who attend church but aren't following Jesus. Be part of the solution, man. And don't let people do that. Man, if you're visiting with us, I'm usually much nicer and lighter hearted. <laughs> Everybody who's laughing knows me. Uh, I want to apologize, but but... Just trying to help you, man. Just, just trying to help you. All right, so let's finish, okay? We need to learn to truly serve one another in extreme humility and in joining one another in walking in holiness, cleansing, uh, washing each other's feet. Third great lesson, John 13, 16 to 17, switching back to ESV. Sorry, I'm kind of switching back and forth this message. Truly, truly, verse 16 says, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor, a, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, get your pen out or your pencil, or your highlighter, here it is. If you know these things, so what, is my paraphrase. Blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. If Jesus has taken on the lowest role of servant in humility, where does it put us? If Jesus has served even his enemies, even the enemy that would betray him to death, if he has served him in extreme humility, where does that put us with our perceived enemies? If Jesus has done this, how much more are we required to do it? If you know these things, verse 17 says, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you serve one another. Just stay in the family, man, and serve one another and hold one another up and wash one another's feet and be there for one another so that we can be transformed together into the image of Christ. Blessed are you if you serve your family like this. That's the other real problem, as long as I'm being cynical. You know, people gladly serving people they don't know, but having a hard time serving their own family. 
add that to the offended list today. Uh, <laughs> blessed are you if you serve your enemies this way. All right, listen, I, I just got to confess to you, all right? I have a hard time with that one. I have a hard time with that one, man, because uh, the, 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 the enemy makes sure that, the spiritual enemy makes sure that my flesh causes enemies in the flesh. You know, I have a lot of people that somehow I've offended. I don't know how. Uh, and uh, man, they really become enemies. And um, this is for me. I have to lay my life down for them. Knowing that they are in the process of betraying me. That's some supernatural stuff right there, okay? You can't do that in the flesh. That's Christ in you or it's not happening. James 1, write it down, I'm closing. But don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you're fooling yourselves. Let's make a commitment today to not fool ourselves, shall we? Let's make a commitment today to seek God with all that we have until our own flesh is being continually crucified, until we are daily being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and until we see the evidence of the life of Christ living in us and through us in our relationships with other people. Let's do that. Let's do that because it brings, it brings the Lord so much glory and it transforms our life and and it puts us in the eternal realm. Let's do that. Here's all it takes. Truly humble yourself extremely. Walk in daily holiness and be willing to serve one another even unto death. You do that, it will transform every area of your life, I promise. Again, John 13, 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. <laughs> it's been a while, Lord, since um, you've been pressed on me the hammer like that, Lord. And I'm glad it's been a while, God. Lord, make us who you call us to be. That's our prayer. Make us who you call us to be. Stripped of ourself, and full of you. No longer living in the world or as the world lives, but walking in the Spirit and living in you, Jesus. No longer seeing our responses in our own flesh, but seeing you, your life, Jesus, the power of your Spirit, giving us supernatural responses. Right now, wherever you're at with God, right now I want to give you a chance to respond. If this might be the first time you were in church, I, I, there was a time when I was 19, it was the first time I was in church, and I'm probably glad I didn't hear a message like this one. But it might be your first time in church. I pray the Holy Spirit is even drawing you to himself, knowing the need in your life to be transformed. And if you're following Jesus today, I don't know how this message can get past you without, without at least uh, convicting in some place. Where this message has convicted you, if it has, would you please respond to the Lord right now? Just right now. I'm going to be quiet right now, and you talk to the Lord about that area. Lord, I know. I know. that I get it. I know. I see that face. I see that relationship. I see that situation. I will, I'll do it, Lord. I'll do it. I repent. I agree with you, it's sinful. I'll do what you're calling me to do. Okay, ready? You pray that prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, all we have is the choice to turn our back on sin in the flesh and the world. All we have is the choice, Lord, and if we'll choose, you'll be the power. You'll flood into our lives, Lord. You'll render the old man inoperative. You'll crucify the flesh. And you'll transform us into your image from glory to glory as we behold your beauty, Lord. So, Lord, right now we commit 
to turn our back on the responses of the flesh and to fight to follow you, to fight the flesh, to fight the self, Lord, to be transformed into your image, to be made new, to walk in the spirit, to bring glory to your name in our lives, Lord. Do it in us by your power, for your name, Jesus, amen.